It's 1961, and Joseph Kittinger is about to set a stunning record that will stand for over half a century. A test pilot and officer with the United States Air Force, Kittinger has spent the last six years building to this moment. Sitting inside a small steel capsule, too small to stand up in, the air grows thinner and thinner as a massive polyethylene balloon carries the pilot and container higher into the sky. This is Project Excelsior, and its mission is to test the ability of a human being to survive a suborbital freefall. That's right, Joseph Kittinger is about to jump out of a steel coffin at nearly 103,000 feet above the ground. Now sitting at the desired height, Kittinger prepares himself. This is his third time leaping from the heavens. The first time nearly killed him when a chute malfunction caused him to lose consciousness and nearly plummet to his death. Now on his third and final jump, Kittinger knows he has one last chance to make history. He does one last equipment check, opens the door, looks out at the expanse of the earth before him, and finally, he leaps. Welcome to History Snob. Joseph Kittinger's jump was the culmination of an often forgotten but extremely important Air Force project that began in 1955. Project Manhigh and Project Excelsior ran almost parallel to the far more public space program of the time. While NASA was working on sending people into space with liquid-fueled rockets, over in New Mexico, one man was attempting to send them into space with a balloon. Before we get to that, however, we should talk about the certifiable daredevil behind this project. Dr. John Paul Stapp might look like an ordinary man, but looks can be deceiving. Stapp was a flight surgeon and researcher for the United States Air Force in the 1950s. During this time, the U.S. military was making great leaps in aerospace technology, and its planes were getting faster and faster. This raised an important question. How fast was too fast, especially when it comes to the human body? At the time, the Air Force firmly believed that a pilot could only survive up to 18 Gs of acceleration. Stapp thought differently. He began a series of stress tests involving bending and jiggling various people with more and more seemingly preposterous machinery. He was systematically charting the limits on the human body and attempting to quantify what was needed to survive the immense power of a new age of aircraft. His biggest concern, however, was the effects of G-force on a pilot. Seeking to test these limits, he developed something more at home in a stunt show than on an Air Force base. This was the rocket sled. A simple steel toboggan attached to a single stretch of railway, the sled was then equipped with various rocket propellants. Stapp knew that the danger in using this contraption was very real, so he took a unique risk and often tested the device himself. Stapp once claimed that he was more comfortable breaking ribs and rupturing blood vessels on the sled then he would be attending a court-martial for killing a test pilot. He ended up taking multiple rides, easily breaking the 18G limit previously set by the Air Force. When he reached 32 Gs on one run, he was explicitly ordered to cease testing by his superiors. He didn't listen. On his final ride, Stapp had mounted eight separate high-powered rockets to the sled. This was the most power he, or anyone, had ever attempted to harness. He strapped himself into the sled with an emergency crew standing by. Stapp then took a deep breath, closed his eyes, and let the rockets ignite. The sled launched, accelerating to a jaw-dropping speed. The whole contraption traveled the entire length of the rail in the blink of an eye, stopping suddenly in 1.8 seconds flat. By the time the medics rushed the sled, Stapp was brutally injured. His ribs and wrists were broken, his organs bruised, and the blood vessels in his corneas had ruptured. Temporarily blind, Stapp was rushed to the Air Force Hospital, where he slowly recovered. This was the price Stapp had to pay to become the fastest man alive. 
he had reached a top speed of 632 miles per hour, and his body had sustained a bone-crushing 46.2 Gs of force. Stepp's Daredevil record had proven many important things to the Air Force. The biggest was that the human body could survive the forces necessary to eject a pilot from a craft at 30,000 feet. His tests also led to the development of new types of harnesses and restraints. His designs would be used in the next generation of jet fighters and eventually end up as the three-point harness we see in every car manufactured today. Stapp wasn't done there. Now a minor celebrity thanks to his record-setting ride, Stapp turned his attention from going fast to going high. By the mid-60s, space travel was an exciting and highly valued field in the U.S. government. But a decade before, in 1955, it was considered the stuff of kooks. So when Stapp told Air Force leadership that he wanted to send a man into the stratosphere, he was laughed out of the room. Still, he pushed and received a small budget and team necessary to attempt something previously in the realm of science fiction. Rocketry was in its infancy at the time, and the idea of using rockets for space travel was unheard of. Stapp instead turned to a far older technology, the balloon. Hot air balloons had existed since the earliest days of the United States. The French had launched some of the first models in the late 1700s, and the technology hadn't really advanced since then. The canvas balloons of old were far too heavy to reach the heights needed for Stapp's experiments. However, a new technology had just come along that could change everything. Polyethylene plastic was relatively new in 1955, being first used by the public at large. While we would come to see it in everything from shopping bags to auto parts, back then it was basically a novelty. Stapp saw a new use for it though. The material was light enough to rise easily into the air, but strong enough to avoid ripping or failing mid-flight. His team set about crafting the suitable balloons needed for Project Manhigh. They created a design that would inflate as the air pressure dropped, allowing stable upward travel. After the balloon was crafted, Stapp turned his attention to the gondola that would carry his aeronaut into the sky. While a few years later NASA would have practically unlimited funding, Stapp's project was forced to pinch every penny. On a minimal budget, his team built a pseudo-space capsule filled with as much technology as they could stuff in it. Having to be small and light enough to carry a man upwards, his ultimate design was half top-of-the-line tech and half bubblegum and tape. The first flight took place on June 2, 1957, after two years of hard work. This first flight would be taken by Kittinger, who was already an accomplished test pilot. He was specifically chosen by Stapp because he wanted someone who could handle himself in a life or death emergency. Kittinger was loaded into the gondola, hooked up to oxygen and a radio, and prepared for his flight. After a time, everything was ready, and Manhai 1 was released. The balloon traveled steadily into the air, rising towards the edge of space. Things seemed fine at first, but a dangerous problem quickly arose. Kittinger was losing oxygen at a rapid pace. Unbeknownst to him and the flight team, a crucial valve had been installed backwards and was leaking precious air out of the capsule. Realizing the problem, Kittinger reversed course and began to let gas out of the balloon. He landed safely, aborting the flight early. Still, it was a success by Stapp's standards. Not only had he found several crucial flaws in his design, he and Kittinger had just set a world record. Kittinger was the highest man ever, reaching 96,800 feet in the air. The next flight would break this record. Manhai 2 was launched on August 19, 1957 from the same location. This time it was piloted by Major David Simmons. Simmons was in the air for a staggering 32 hours as his balloon traveled the edge of the stratosphere. While locked in a steel capsule too small to stand up in, Simmons ran several key experiments, including solving math 
and word problems designed to test the stress of low atmosphere on his cognitive abilities. That's right, they locked him in a steel coffin 100,000 feet in the air and then made him do homework. This was incredibly important work. One of the key things being tested by the whole Manhai project was the effect of space travel on the human body. Scientists at the time were worried that once removed from the protective layer of Earth's atmosphere, the human body would be bombarded with cosmic radiation. Some even believed that this could be instantly fatal, or at the very least would deeply mentally impair any potential astronaut. Manhai proved them all wrong. Once he was back on the ground, Simmons passed every physical exam he was given. The scientific equipment on board also showed that the radiation's effects were negligible. Simmons had also just broken Manhai 1's record, with the pilot having traveled 101,516 feet into the air. This accomplishment earned Simmons a spot on the cover of Life magazine and a hero's welcome. Stapp's Manhai project had been a huge success. So naturally, the Air Force slashed his budget drastically before the third flight. In late 1957, NASA had been established and the Mercury program had begun. Stapp's own work proved invaluable for this program. It was his criteria for selecting the most physically and psychologically capable men that had led to the selection of the Mercury 7. However, he still had work to do. The third and final Manhai mission was launched in early October 1958. This flight had been mostly privately paid for by a wealthy couple, who had agreed to fund Stapp's work to its conclusion. The third flight was a success, carrying its pilot to a height of 98,000 feet. This looked like the end of Stapp's balloon experiments, but the Air Force physician still had one burning question that he needed answered. He had sent a man 100,000 feet into the air, but could that same man survive returning to Earth as fast as possible? The idea of an emergency escape from a failing spacecraft was foremost on both NASA and the Air Force's mind. If a pilot was forced to bail out of a vehicle at 100,000 feet, what would they need to return to the ground safely? A traditional parachute would take too long to bring a man down, potentially killing him from exposure and lack of oxygen. However, a free fall of tens of thousands of feet would send him into a deadly spin, also killing him. What was needed was a new system, one small chute to control the fall and another to open at just the right height. Stapp and his team got to work, and by the end of the decade, they had a new parachute system. There was only one way to test it. Stapp broke out his trusty balloons once more and began Project Excelsior. He turned again to test pilot Joe Kittinger, who would make three separate jumps between 1959 and 1960. The first test was a failure. Kittinger jumped from over 76,000 feet. His control chute failed and sent him into a flat spin. He lost consciousness mid-jump, but fortunately his second chute opened his plant, saving his life. The second jump happened three weeks later and was far more successful. This time the chutes opened his plant and he landed safely. The third jump was the real test. The custom gondola took Kittinger up to a staggering height of 102,800 feet. It took over an hour to reach this height, and once the balloon settled in the stratosphere, Kittinger was ready. He was so high that he could see the curve of the planet and the clear terminator line between the blue sky of Earth and the blackness of space. Standing on the edge of heaven, Kittinger said a small prayer, took a deep breath, and stepped out into the void. He fell for an eternity, with the fall taking 4 minutes and 36 seconds of sheer terror. There was no sound at first only the steady breathing inside his helmet. As he got closer to Earth, the air began to thicken and the sound of rushing wind returned. A tiny speck traveling through an endless sky, Kittinger had plenty of time to contemplate every possible way he could die. Finally, after an excruciating wait, 
he felt the rude, sharp jerk of his main chute opening. Finally, Kittinger slowly drifted back to the ground, landing safely on the New Mexico sands. Kittinger and Stapp had just set a record for the highest skydive and the longest freefall in human history. This is a record that would stand for a staggering 52 years, only broken in 2012 by Felix Bumgartner's flight in the Red Bull Stratos. Manhigh and Excelsior were massive successes, but their accomplishments would be quickly overshadowed by NASA and the US space program in the next decade. Still, it's important to remember the fearless and unbelievable work of Stapp Kittinger, and the rest of the team on these two projects. Thanks to Stapp's work, thousands of pilots and potentially millions of motorists have had their lives saved. Under his watch and the willingness of men like Kittinger to put their own lives on the line, humanity was able to take its first steps into the vastness of space. What do you think of Project Manhigh and the men who made it happen? Leave a comment and like and subscribe for more great videos from History Snob. Thanks for watching.